Hello, fourth grade, and welcome to Unit 2, Week 4 of Language Arts. I'm going to get started with our vocabulary words. So your first word is the word pounce. So when an animal pounces on something or a person pounces on something, they're jumping or they're springing up very suddenly uh, to attack, whatever it is. So we can say the spider waits to pounce on an insect or the cheetah waited quietly in the bushes so that it could pounce on the deer. So pounce means to jump really suddenly when you're trying to attack something or catch something. Prey, P-R-E-Y, is an animal that is hunted for food by another animal. So the deer is the prey of the lion. Uh, so prey means the animal that's, that's being hunted by another animal for food that gets eaten. Your third word is the word dribbles. Dribbles means something to kind of like drip or in like small drops kind of drop down. So uh, think of a little kid when they're drinking out of a really big cup. Uh, you can see usually that their water or the milk or whatever they're, they're drinking dribbles down their chin, right? It's kind of like spilling in a steady little stream with little drops. Uh, your next word is the word poisonous. So when something is poisonous, that means it has poison, like different kinds of chemicals that in, in it that cause harm or injury or death to whatever the thing is. So it can, something that's poisonous can kill you or make you feel really sick because whatever that insect or, uh, has in its body when it's putting that poison onto another living thing, that poison is usually going to cause some kind of damage or harm or the thing might die. So a spider injects poisonous venom into its prey to stop it from moving. Some extraordinary, your next word is extraordinary. Something that's extraordinary is unusual or remarkable. So something that's extraordinary is something that'll catch your attention. You look at it, you're like, wow, that's, that's really different. That's really um, unusual. So it's something that it's, something that's out of the ordinary. So a spider has extraordinary senses all over its body. You know, it has multiple eyes so it can see really clearly. It has, it's very sensitive so that it feels any kind of vibrations. Um, so something that's extraordinary is, it comes from the word, you see it broken down into extra and ordinary. Extra means more than something that's ordinary or normal. So something that's very unique that catches your attention and it's something that that is not common. Your next word is the word vibrations. Vibrations are really quick movements back and forth. Uh, so if you see a guitar and you you pluck one of the strings on the guitar you see it vibrating or moving back and forth really fast. Your next word is the word camouflaged. So when something is camouflaged it has the ability to blend in and hide with its surroundings. So things that are camouflaged usually are the same color as their surroundings or the things that are around them so that they're able to hide and not be noticed very easily. And your last word is the word predator. So a predator is like the hunter animal. It's the animal that eats other animals. So you have your predators and your prey. The predator hunts the prey to eat it. So a lion is a dangerous predator, right? The lion is a predator and maybe the deer is the prey. So let's go into your spelling words for this week. Now this week you're focusing on what we call R controlled vowels. So this is, R controlled vowels are when there is a vowel letter before the letter R that gives it a stronger sound. So it's not just R. So you say R or R, so think of like a pirate, right? So your words are dart, guard, award, backyard, argue, spark, target, smart, charge, carpet, rat, warp, door, fort, morning, stork, cord, warn, stormy, core, bore, screech, shrimp, throat, charcoal, and forecast. So you're hearing that strong or sound when you're reading a word that has an R-controlled vowel in it.
Now let's jump into your language arts and grammar notes for this week. So the first thing we're going to review, we've talked about this in the past, are prefixes and suffixes. Now remember, prefixes and suffixes are word parts. They're not whole words. There are a couple letters that are added on to either the beginning or the end of a word. And they come from the word affix. So to affix something is to stick it to something or to attach it to something. So a prefix or a suffix is stuck on or attached to the base word that you're talking about. Now, what do they do? Why do we even put them on the words? Well, we add prefixes and suffixes to our words to change the meaning of the word, to give it a new and unique and different meaning. So prefixes come before the word because the word prefix has a prefix in it. Pre means before. So we are fixing something onto the word or we're attaching something before the word. So a prefix comes before the word and a suffix comes after or at the end of the word. So your prefixes that we're going to talk about today are re, un, and dis. Re means again, like rewrite or reread. Un means not. So when you put it in front of a word, it means not, whatever that word is saying. So unhappy is not happy. Unclean is not clean. And you have dis, D-I-S. Dis basically turns the word into its antonym. It gives you the opposite meaning. So if you dislike something, it is the opposite of liking it. If something disappears, it's the opposite of appearing or something that you're able to see. If you are in disbelief, it is the opposite of believing something. You can't believe it. Now suffixes, like we said, come at the end of the word. So the first suffix we're going to talk about is full, F-U-L, not the word full, F-U-L-L, -L, that has two L's in it. The suffix full is just F-U-L, just one L. And it means full of something. So someone who is beautiful is full of beauty. Someone who is doing something in a very careful way is doing it in a way that's full of care. If something is peaceful, it's full of peace. Now your other suffix is less. Less means without something. So if someone is fearless, they are without fear. They don't have any fear. If someone is penniless, they don't have any pennies, like they don't have any money. Or if something is hopeless, they don't have any hope or there's no hope in it. Now, just like we did with plurals, when your base word has a consonant letter plus the letter Y, you have to change that Y into an I before you add anything else, whether you're making it a plural, whether you're making it, uh, whether you're adding a suffix, you have to make sure that you are changing that Y into an I before you add whatever ending you're adding. So pennyless comes from the word penny plus less. So penny is P-E-N-N-Y. But when I write pennyless, I change that Y into an I, and then I add that suffix. So let's go on and talk about irregular plural nouns. Now we have regular plural nouns, which have an S or an ES at the end of it, right? Cat, cats, watch, watches, class, classes, dog, dogs, girl, girls, boy, boys, and so on. Irregular plurals don't follow that SES rule. So some irregular plurals are ones that you know and you use pretty often are like the word child becomes children, man becomes men, ox becomes oxen, person becomes people, and so on. I've got a bunch of examples listed for you. Uh, so, and there are some words that when they become a plural don't change their spelling. So their spelling stays the same you don't add or change anything, whether you're talking about them in singular form, about just one, or if you're talking about them in plural form, where you're talking about more than one. So a few examples of this are the word deer, sheep, scissors, moose, salmon, and fish. So in order for you to know which form of the word we're using in the sentence, so are we talking about the singular form or are we talking about the plural form? you have to take your clues from the words that are around it. So if I say the, the deer travel in a group, I'm talking about more than one. If I talk about the flock of sheep, I'm talking about a group more than one. If I'm talking about the boy's scissors, the scissors that belong to the one boy, I'm talking about one. 
But if I'm saying the children's scissors, I'm talking about more than one because I, I'm using my clue from the word children to tell me that there's more than one. Uh, the herd of moose or a moose, right? We'll tell you if it's singular or plural. I saw a salmon in the river or the salmon are all swimming up river. We'll tell you singular or plural. A, when usually when you say a something, you're talking about one of it. Um, and that's usually one of your biggest clues. Uh, the fish swam in its fishbowl or the fish are swimming in their tank. So are and there are clues to tell you that that's in plural form. Now we also have another rule that applies to most words, unfortunately not all of them, but most words that end with the letter F or LF. So if a word ends with F or LF, that final letter F changes to a V before you add ES to make it plural. So calf becomes calves, half becomes halves, wife becomes wives, elf becomes elves. So you see that that final F, whether it's LF, F or FE, um, will change into the letter V before you add the ES onto the end of it. Now, there are two words that I can think of that don't follow this rule. So roof stays roofs and chef stays chefs, but the other ones do change. Now, the last part of our notes that we're going to talk about are possessive nouns. Now we have talked about this in the past, but we're going to review it today. So possessive nouns show ownership. It tells you that something belongs to that noun. So singular possessive nouns, we add an apostrophe S after the noun to show that something belongs to it. So the bowl that belongs to the cat, I'm going to say the cat's bowl. So cat apostrophe S. That apostrophe S tells me I'm talking about something that belongs to that cat. So if I say the pet that belongs to our class, I'm going to say our class's pet. So class apostrophe S. Yes, I know that this already, the word class already has an S at the end of it. And usually when we're talking about making something plural, if it ends with an S, we add an ES at the end of it, but we're not making this plural. Possessives and plurals are two different things. Plural means more than one. Possessive means that noun owns something or something belongs to it. So for singular possessive nouns, we add an apostrophe S onto the end of it. Now, if we have regular plural nouns. So regular plurals, again, end with an S or ES, and we want to make that regular plural into a possessive. So a plural possessive noun. We're talking about something that belongs to a plural noun or a group of things. Uh, since a regular plural already ends with, has an S at the end of it, we're only going to add an apostrophe after that final S. So if, instead of saying the toys that belong to the group of kids, I'll say the kids' toys. So K-I-D-S apostrophe, and then the word toys. Now, if I'm talking about the books that belong to the students. So students is plural, right? It ends with an S already. So I would say the students books, student S apostrophe at the end, and then the word books. Now we also have uh, what we talked about before, collective nouns and irregular plurals. Now remember irregular plurals don't follow that SES rule like child becomes children or man becomes men or tooth becomes teeth and so on. Those are irregular plurals. Collective nouns we've also talked about in the past talk about a group of things, like a family is a group of related people or animals. A herd is a group of land animals like sheep or buffalo. A flock is a group of birds. A litter is a group of baby animals like puppies or kittens. An army is a group of soldiers. A band is a group of musicians. And a swarm is a group of flying insects like bees. So these are some examples of collective nouns. There are many, many more. But one thing I want you to remember for collective and irregular plurals, you treat them exactly the same way as you treat a singular noun when you want to make it possessive. 
which means you just throw an apostrophe S on the end of it, and that shows that it is now a possessive, the possessive form of that collective noun or that possessive form of that irregular plural noun. So just to review, singular possessive, collective and irregular plurals all get an apostrophe S at the end to show ownership. Plural possessive, regular plural possessive nouns get an apostrophe after that final S to show possession or ownership. So I have a table here. Uh, this is similar to one that we've reviewed in the past. So I have my regular nouns, uh, the singular possessive form of those regular nouns, uh, the regular plural form in, and possessive form for those nouns. And then at the bottom, I have uh, some irregular nouns and some collective nouns. So I'm going to let you guys review these and go over them and you can see the differences. I'm going to focus right now on these bottom portions. So child, talking about one kid, when I'm talking about something that belongs to that one child, I'm going to say child's, so the child's toy or the child's juice box, right? I'm talking about something that belongs to one kid. But if I'm talking about a group, I'm going to say children and I'm going to add the apostrophe S to show that it is possessive. So the children's books, or the children's juice boxes, right? That apostrophe S shows me that I'm talking about a possessive form of that collective noun or that irregular noun. So person, when we're talking about something that belongs to that one person, I can say the person's umbrella belongs, it's the umbrella that belongs to that one person, or I'll say the people's umbrellas. And I know I'm talking about the irregular plural form uh, of this word and I've made it possessive by adding that apostrophe S. Same thing for the word man. So the man's shoes or the men's shoes when I'm talking about the irregular plural form and a possessive form of that irregular plural. So the irregular plural possessive for man is men's. Now, if I'm talking about collectives, there's no singular form because a collective noun is talking about a group. So a herd or the herd's habitat, a family or the family's cars. So these are, these again are called collective nouns. They're talking about a group of something. So remember a collective noun is a singular form of a word that talks about a group. So even though the word over here doesn't have an S or ES, right, at the end of it, the meaning of it tells us that we're talking about a group. So I've got some pictures down here to show you what I mean. So I can talk about the bow that belongs to the puppy. Since this is a singular noun that I'm going to make possessive, I'm going to say the puppy's bow, apostrophe S. The green hat that belongs to the boy, boy is a singular noun. I'm going to say the boy's green hat. So boy apostrophe S. That apostrophe S tells me that this green hat belongs to this one boy. Now, if I'm talking about irregular plurals, I can say the playground that belongs to the children. Now, children is an irregular plural, right? It's the, it's the irregular plural form of the word child. So if I want to talk about something that belongs to the children, I'm going to put an apostrophe S at the end of it, right? So the children's playground, so children apostrophe S. If I want to talk about the beautiful dresses that belong to the women, remember women is an irregular plural form of woman. So the women's beautiful dresses, women apostrophe S. Now I can also talk about collectives. So remember we treat irregular plurals and collectives the same way we treat singular nouns when we want to make them possessive. So the instruments that belong to the band, I know that the word band is a collective noun, right? That talks about a group of musicians. So I'll talk about, I'll say the band's instruments. So we're talking about all the instruments that belong to this band or this, this group of musicians. Now let's get into our literature anthology book and we're going to go to unit two, week four. And this story is all about different kinds of spiders. Genre. Expository text. 
Essential question. What helps an animal survive? Read how spiders have adapted to survive. Spiders by Nick Bishop. Some spiders are as small as a grain of sand. The biggest, the Goliath bird eater tarantula from South America, is as big as a page in this book. Yet all spiders share similar features. They have eight legs, fangs, spin silk, and eat other animals. At first, you might confuse them with insects, but it is easy to tell the difference. Insects have six legs, spiders have eight, and spiders never have wings. The Goliath bird eater tarantula likes to stay near its burrow on the rainforest floor. It waits for prey to come close enough to grab. A spider's body has two main parts. The back part is called the abdomen. This contains the heart, which pumps pale blue blood. Yes, blue. And the spinnerets, which make silk. The front, or head part, is called the cephalothorax. It has the spider's legs, eyes, fangs, brain, stomach, and two short arms, called pedipalps, which a spider uses to hold its prey. The green link spider is perfectly camouflaged when it hides among leaves waiting to pounce on an insect. The long black spines on its legs are thought to help it trap its prey. Spiders eat in an unusual way. They don't chew and swallow food like you do. They drink it. First, the spider stabs its prey with its fangs and injects poisonous venom to stop it from moving. Then it dribbles digestive juices on its meal. This turns the animal's insides into soup, so the spider can slurp them out. Afterward, all that's left of the prey are empty bits of skin and some wings. This black widow spider has just caught a wasp in her web. She will feed once she has wrapped it safely in silk. Most spiders have eight eyes, so they can look several ways at once but a spider cannot see as clearly as you. Their eyes are usually very small and simple. Spiders will notice if something moves nearby, but they often cannot see shapes very well. A few spiders have no eyes at all. They live deep inside caves where it is completely dark all the time, but they have no trouble catching prey. That's because spiders have other amazing senses to rely on. The long-jawed spider is a web builder. It gets its name from the very long jaws that hold the two thin fangs, which you can see folded underneath. A spider does not have a nose or ears, at least not like you do. Even so, it has extraordinary senses all over its body. Take a close look. You will see this spider is covered with hairs. Many of these sense touch, vibrations, and sounds. Hairs on a spider's legs can sense the sound of a flying insect. Other organs on the feet can smell and taste things just by walking on them. A spider can even recognize the taste of its own silk by touching it. This huntsman spider is beautifully camouflaged on a rainforest leaf. Hairs on its body and legs will sense the vibrations made by the footsteps of an approaching insect. Spider skin is made of tough stuff called chitin. It is the spider's personal body armor, as well as its skeleton. Spiders don't have bones inside their body for support. Their hard skin is like a skeleton they wear on the outside. It protects and supports the spider's body. This hard skin does not stretch, 
so a spider must molt now and then as it grows. The spider finds a safe place and then slowly squeezes out of its old skin. It can take an hour and is very stressful. The spider must even shed the skin covering its eyes and the inside of its mouth. Afterward, its new skin is damp and soft like putty. The spider rests until its new skin dries and hardens. A cobalt blue tarantula has to roll onto its back to molt. It is pulling the old skin off its legs. Its new fangs are pure white, but will turn dark later. Silk is the secret of spider success. Spiders make several different types, which can be sticky, stretchy, strong, or fluffy. Each has a special use. For making egg sacs, wrapping prey, building webs, or making drag lines that the spider trails as it walks along or jumps. Silk is made by the spinnerets on the spider's abdomen. Liquid threads come out of dozens of tiny nozzles and turn solid as the spider pulls them. Spider silk is an amazing substance. It can be stronger than steel and can stretch twice its own length. Best of all, it's recyclable. A spider can eat its silk when it has finished with it. A black and yellow garden spider will use its legs to turn its prey as it wraps it with silk from its spinnerets. Spider webs are made of silk. Some webs look like old tissue paper draped on hedges. Others hang in messy tangles in the corner of your garage. But the best known is the orb web, with its wonderful spiral of sticky threads. A large orb web may contain more than 100 feet of silk thread, and can take about an hour to build. Most spiders build their webs at night, working by touch. Once finished, the spider sits in the middle, or at the edge, and holds the web so it can feel the vibration of a trapped insect. If the prey is a dangerous wasp, the spider may cut it free. Otherwise, it wraps the prey in silk and bites. Orb web spiders have special claws and nonstick feet, so they can walk on their webs without getting stuck. All right, so that takes us to the end of our reading about spiders. Um, we're also going to read a trickster tale uh, about a spider called Anansi. Anansi and the Birds Anansi always welcomed a challenge. His attempts to fool merchants out of their riches and lions from their jungle thrones made for exciting adventures. Today he would show those haughty birds that he could fly with the best of them. He begged a feather from every bird he could find to create his own pair of wings, and then he began to practice flying. Anansi's wings camouflaged him well, and he looked just like a bird. Hoot! the old owl chided under the moon. A spider is not meant for the sky. Why do you try to be something you are not? Mind your business, Owl, Anansi replied angrily. You are a predator, so go hunt some mice. Anansi followed the birds to their feast on the top of a mountain peak. He helped himself to their fare, shoving birds aside to get his fill. When he was full, he fell into a deep sleep. Angrily, the birds took back the feathers from his wings and then left, all except for one crow. When Anansi awoke, he realized what had happened and begged the crow to help him get down the mountain. Of course, the crow replied slyly, as he shoved Anansi over a cliff. Ay, shouted Anansi. Unable to fly, he tumbled helplessly through the air. The old owl appeared before him, asking, why didn't you listen, Anansi? You are not a bird. Please help me, Owl, pleaded Anansi. The Owl urged Anansi, Push in your belly. When he did, threads of silk shot out behind him. The Owl caught them 
and tied them to a high branch. Dangling by threads, Anansi realized the owl was right. From that day on, he stuck to spinning webs instead of trying to be something he was not. All right, that takes us to the end of our stories in our literature anthology. We're going to jump into our reading and writing workshop, and we're going to talk about animal adaptations. Genre. Expository text. Animal adaptations. What would you do if you saw a skunk raise his tail? If you knew anything about skunks, you would run in the opposite direction. Skunks have a built-in survival system. They can blast a predator with a horrible-smelling spray produced by the glands under their tails. The special ways that animals have to survive are called adaptations. These include physical traits, such as the skunk spray, and animals with bright colors and markings that warn predators that they are poisonous. Some animals can sense the smallest vibrations in the ground. Others hear sounds from miles away. An adaptation can also be a behavioral trait. An example of a behavioral trait would be birds that migrate south every winter to avoid harsh temperatures. Staying warm. Brr. Imagine living in a place where the average annual temperature is an extraordinary 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Welcome to the Arctic tundra of Alaska, Canada, Greenland, and Russia, home of the caribou. To stay warm, caribou have two layers of fur and a thick layer of fat. They also have compact bodies, only four or five feet long. Caribou can weigh over 500 pounds. The tip of the caribou's nose and mouth is called a muzzle. It is covered in short hair. This hair helps to warm the air before they inhale it into their lungs. It also helps to keep them warm as they push snow aside to find food. When a skunk turns and sprays a predator, the foul-smelling mist can travel up to 10 feet. Finding food. Every day, a caribou eats over six pounds of lichen. Caribou have unusual stomachs. The stomach's four chambers are designed to digest lichen. It is one of the few foods they can find in the winter. Even so, caribou still have a tough time in the coldest part of winter when their food sources decline. That's why they travel from the tundra to a large forest area where food is easier to find. When the melting snow dribbles into streams, they know it is time to return up north. Insects in Disguise Look closely at the photo of the tree branch. Can you spot the insect? It is a phasmid. Some phasmids are known as leaf insects or walking sticks. Phasmids look like leaves or twigs. These insects can change colors to really blend in with their surroundings. In this way, they are camouflaged from predators. It's as if they disappear from sight. These insects are nocturnal, which means that they are active at night. This is another adaptation that helps them avoid predators. It's hard to spot these insects in daylight, let alone at night. Lichen can grow in extreme temperatures. This phasmid is called a walking stick because it looks like a stick with legs. Water, please. In Florida's vast Everglades ecosystem, the dry season is brutal for many plants and animals. Alligators have found a way to survive these dry conditions in the freshwater marshes. They use their feet and snouts to clear dirt from holes in the limestone bedrock. When the ground dries up, the alligators can drink from their water holes. Other species benefit from these water holes, too. Plants grow there. Other animals find water to survive the dry season. 
However, the animals that visit alligator holes become easy prey. The normally motionless alligator may pounce on them without warning. But luckily, alligators eat only a few times each month. Many animals take their chances and revisit the alligator hole when they need water. In the end, it's all about survival. The alligator's physical adaptations include its log-shaped body. Other animals have trouble spotting the motionless alligator in the water. All right, so that's the end of our stories for this week. Now we're going to talk about our comprehension skill and strategy. And our comprehension strategy this week focuses on summarizing. So when you summarize something, you're telling just the important parts. So think about when you're telling your friend about a story that you read. You're not telling them every single word in the story. You're telling them the most important part of the story so they know what the story was about. Now we're also going to revisit the main idea and key details in a story. So when you're reading something, the main idea is what that entire thing that you're reading, that whole passage is about. And the key details are what give you more information about it. So let's go ahead and take a look at this part of our notes. Summarize. When you summarize, you retell the most important details in a paragraph or section of text. Summarize sections of animal adaptations to help you understand the information. Find text evidence. Identify key details to summarize the section. Insects in disguise. Look closely at the photo of the tree branch. Can you spot the insect? It is a phasmid. Some phasmids are known as leaf insects or walking sticks. Phasmids look like leaves or twigs. These insects can change colors to really blend in with their surroundings. In this way, they are camouflaged from predators. It's as if they disappear from sight. These insects are nocturnal, which means that they are active at night. This is another adaptation that helps them avoid predators. It's hard to spot these insects in daylight, let alone at night. Caption This phasmid is called a walking stick because it looks like a stick with legs. Phasmids are insects that can camouflage themselves to avoid predators. In addition, phasmids are nocturnal, which makes them difficult for predators to spot. Main Idea and Key Details The main idea is the most important point that the author makes in a text or a section of the text. Key details give important information to support the main idea. Find Text Evidence When I reread the section Staying Warm in Animal Adaptations on page 137, I can identify the key details then I can think about what those details have in common. Now I can figure out the main idea of the section. Graphic Organizer Main Idea Caribou adaptations help them survive the cold. Detail Caribou have two layers of fur and a thick layer of fat. Detail Short hair on their muzzles warms the air that they inhale. Detail Caribou have compact bodies that can weigh over 500 pounds. Caption All three key details support the main idea. All right, so let's review our genre. Now we're still talking about expository text. Now remember, expository text or informational text give you information or facts about something that you're reading. Expository text. Animal adaptations is an expository text. Expository text gives facts and information about a topic. Includes text features. Find text evidence. Animal adaptations is an expository text.
It gives me facts about how different animals have adapted to survive. Each section has a heading. The text also includes photographs and captions. Text features, photographs and captions. Photographs illustrate what is in the text. Captions provide additional information. Headings. Headings tell what a section of text is mostly about. All right, we're also going to revisit prefixes. Now we talked about this during our notes. These are the same prefixes we talked about earlier, but this will give you a little bit of additional information. Prefixes. As you read animal adaptations, you may come across a word that you don't know. Look for word parts, such as prefixes. A prefix is added to the beginning of a word and changes the meaning of the word. Here are some common prefixes. Un means not. Re means again. Dis means opposite of. Find text evidence. When I read the section Staying Warm on page 137 in Animal Adaptations, I see the word extraordinary. First, I look at the separate word parts. I know that extra is a prefix that changes the meaning of ordinary. The prefix extra means beyond. Imagine living in a place where the average annual temperature is an extraordinary 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so that takes us through to the end of our notes for this week. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, I hope you have an amazing day and a great week, fourth grade. Take care. Bye-bye.